basically, um, the question is, how can we make a change in the way crime media is presented, including in this recent Ohio case of the young man killing several people on uh, his school campus. And the, um, the effect of the crime media business kind of began with the O.J. Simpson trial. There you had the intersection of race, you had the intersection of a blonde beauty, you had sports, you had celebrities, you had everything else. And at, after, through that trial, through that amazing divide that happened in the United States of uh, white people thinking that he should go down and essentially African Americans taking a stand that the LA police should not have framed a perhaps guilty man. Um, and what I think what we're looking at is that crime media kind of began, not that there hasn't been yellow journalism, not that there hasn't been, uh, you know, taking us through the muck many times before, but crime media has been so profitable for the cable networks, for the news networks, and for newspapers, magazines, everything else. The only place where there has been a kind of a halt to that, and it's not been a real halt, because you still have an Ann Coulter saying Troy Davis is the new baby seal uh, to protect and things like that. So at this point, we have to really look toward transforming the media, not just the new media, but the traditional media into a new being, if you will. And we, our greatest tool for that is the new media, but it is also a tricky tool to use. Uh, so, I mean, it's interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and I'm not sure, um, you know, it, 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 it's where it kind of taps some of my uh, pessimism. Uh, but uh, one thing I will say is that uh, it, 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 what makes the case interesting is that we have this thing in this country called the school-to-prison pipeline, right? Now, school-to-prison pipeline has to do with the extent to which uh, behaviors are being criminalized for children of color across this country. And children of color are being subjected to uh, disparate disciplinary treatment. And there's a, there's a connection here. Uh, and when you talk to people about what's going on with young teenagers, there are these two different narratives, if you will. Uh, one narrative uh, with the same behavior in a suburban, white suburban school and that, that you might find in a, a downtown uh, kind of urban school. On one hand, the behavior is viewed as simple adolescent developmental stuff, right? Uh, in a suburban setting. In the city school, it's viewed as demonic, uh, evil, hopeless, criminal activity. Now, now we know that. I mean, that's, it's, you know, this notion of school to prison pipeline is not anything new. So, but one question is, the extent to which, outside of the traditional media, it's possible to use new media to link that event and the coverage of this event to the school to prison pipeline. Because I think the issue is then how do we start to mobilize across regions, across the country, getting people to raise the question that's at hand. This is what the issue was in the Troy Davis case as far as I'm concerned. I was very concerned about saving Troy Davis's life Okay? But there also was this bigger issue. The Troy Davis case allowed us to start to mobilize. Now, the question is, what are the limits of that mobilization? And I think those, you know, Rachel alluded to them, they are severe. So I think the challenge is how we get to the point of being able to translate the kind of mass mobilization that we can accomplish uh, through this new media into action. And one of the most telling things about the Troy Davis case was, it, it was it's really fascinating, the difference between it and uh, uh, the so-called Arab Spring was there was an element in the, those camping out uh, at, at the execution site that wanted to take action, okay? Right? In other words, people wanted to take some kind of civil disobedience or more extreme and were counseled not to, right? Okay, so, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, kind of where you draw the line between mobilization and action. 
but I do think that, that the, the, the first step is raising the very question you raise and then thinking about how do we get more people into that conversation. Uh, and then, you know, once they're in the conversation, what do we do? Do we give them the tools to do something? And, and there's lots of stuff that we can do about how you interrupt the school to prison pipeline, how you create programs of restorative justice, how you do all these other things. It, might, it won't bring those people back to life, right? And it won't necessarily address that particular crime, but it, it has the potential to move us forward. I guess I would say that these are problems of attitudes, beliefs, and values. We try and address them in terms of structures and institutions. We will not be able to deal with the structural or institutional. There's no technology on the planet that's going to do anything until those attitudes, beliefs, and values change. And as long as those attitudes, beliefs, and values sustain and protect privileges, they will not change. In the back. A little louder, please. How would I do it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so, sorry. He, he, he asked, how would, how would we use social media to bring about those transformations? And obviously, from the way I just answered the last question, I don't really know if that's possible. What I would say is this. If these issues are going to be addressed, one, they have to, it's, it's, it's beyond social media. This is, a, if it's an educational issue, it's one that has to be addressed very, very early in a very sustained way. And we don't do that in this society. Um, I think our educational systems are geared more towards economics than they are towards morality. So it's a shift in terms of that. And it's cultivating and defining different attitudes and beliefs and values about race and that means doing the type of work that Rachel and David are doing by bringing these issues into public consciousness, I would just say that that has to happen in a more sustained way by people who have investments in keeping the system the way it is now. Um, Mill's discussion of the racial contract is really important because what he says is there are beneficiaries and there are signatories. In a sense, all of us in this room are signatories to the racial contract because we are privileged by it and we benefit from it. But we don't all benefit from it in the same ways. So I, in my work, I talk about re-signing or resigning the racial contract. And the basically, um, I draw upon the, the reconciliation work that was done in, in South Africa. And um, I'll just tell a quick story and then I'll be done. Uh, Jacques Hector was the uh, director of the South African um, secret police. And he went before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they said, are you sorry? And he said, yes, I'm sorry. And he read from a nice prepared um, uh, statement. And as he was walking out, out, out of the commission afterwards, a reporter came up to him and said, are you really sorry? He said, no, I'm not effing sorry. I do the same thing again. So it's easy to say, I'm sorry about something and believe that that's going to lead to reconciliation, but unless there's sincere atonement, I mean, the, the work on reconciliation is clear. Atonement, forgiveness, reparations, reconciliation, that's how the process works. And until we begin to engage that in this country, and we are so far from even beginning to consider that in this country, especially in terms of uh, law, and those of you who are lawyers are probably familiar with Alfred Brophy's work on this. Um, until that happens, we can have all the social media, we can have all the technology we want. It's just, I'm sorry if I'm sounding pessimistic. I, folks. I, I have to say that the, the one thing I love about being someplace with Mark is that he makes me feel like an optimist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange feeling. Uh, I, I want to make a couple of points on that. First of all, in, in an interesting way, implicit bias lives on the internet. There's a thing called the IAT, yeah. all right? You should all know about it. If you don't know about it, you should go take it. It's the implicit association test. Implicit bias is, in fact, measured through computer technology, right? Uh, 
and uh, it, you know, it, you know, it does raise. It's a, it's a fascinating kind of notion because you can go in the privacy of your own home and it's your own computer monitor, and you can take these tests and you can kind of get a sense of how much bias you have, not only on race, on gender, on age, and and it's a very telling thing. So, so a couple of things. One, one thing that that we're trying to work on uh, is trying to introduce the use of the IAT in litigation, right? Uh, you know, my background is in housing discrimination. You know, I, I think it's time that we started to subject people to uh, this IAT to kind of get a sense. People, could, because remember, it's, it can be totally different from your stated views, right? Uh, and, it, and it's important. So that's that one thing is it's tailor-made. We have to figure out exactly how, how to bring it to scale, how to make it operational, but it lives in the, your computer. Implicit, the, the kind of the, the diagnosis of implicit bias lives in your computer. The, the second thing, following up on what Mark said, is that I mentioned before the question of restorative justice. There, there are programs going on, and, and again, the important thing is to kind of understand what's being done that's positive and how we bring it to scale. And we bring it to scale both by letting more people know about it so they demand it, and so that, I mean, that's how you change the institutions. And again, I, you know, I'm not usually this optimistic, but he has this effect on me. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, restorative justice is not that far from truth and reconciliation, but it's down at a much, much, much more pedestrian level. It's something that we can use in schools. There are some places, some, some states have it as part of their uh, kind of legal framework. Uh, we have to think about how we tear these structures, how we alter these structures. There are ways, right? The, the question is kind of how we bring them to scale, right? The other thing I will say is I'm reminded of uh, uh, William Faulkner, right, my, my favorite author. You know, I named my son Quentin. You know, I love Faulkner. And Faulkner, but Faulkner was amazing. Fa now I'm going to sound like Mark, because at one point somebody said to Faulkner, Mr. Faulkner, uh, you know, you really seem to understand the Negro. You, you really are uh, such a great uh, writer who, who captures the, the real kind of essence of the Negro. And, and Faulkner said, listen, don't kid yourself. If there were a race war in this country, I know exactly which side I'd come down on, right? And, and it's fascinating, a guy like Faulkner, I mean, and that's where this stuff, that, where the rubber hits the road is at that point at which your actual interests really raise their ugly little head and you have to deal with them, okay? But there, we take these little, small, incremental steps. You know, one little thing um, also about how new media can help. Traditional media generally portrays African Americans at, in either sports or as entertainers or as criminals. Those are the three ways. And rap artists, I mean, which is kind of edging into this notion of criminality. Um, it, it takes really portraying people differently over a period of time. That narrative that what we hear and what we see is what we believe becomes truer and truer as we see it over and over. Um, what we see in new media is beginning to make a dent in that. We're seeing people overseas that are different from us, and they're not less human. We're seeing people that are in our own culture that are different from us, and they're not worth, uh, they're not less worthy of living than we are. Um, so I think that the new media is in many ways the hope for um, making change in the uh, what I would call the traditional and corporate-owned business of, of traditional media. Yeah. Could you stand up? And, yeah. Do you want to take that? No, I want to hear Mark to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, um, I would ask you to share the paper that I wrote with my colleague, David Frank, um, that addresses this issue directly. Uh, we do an analysis of the 2004 Democratic National Convention speech and compare it to uh, Reverend Sharpton's address.